headlines. President Barack Obama says Washington is considering putting North Korea back on the list of terrorism sponsoring states for its alleged cyber attack on Sony Pictures. The Korean government lowers economic growth projections for this year and the next and promises continued expansionary macroeconomic policy and reform drives. And Korea's vice energy minister maintains the country's nuclear reactors remain safe despite a series of information leaks online. Hello and welcome to Arirang News. Happy Monday, everyone. Coming to you live from Seoul, I am Kang Chedi. U.S. President Barack Obama says he's considering putting North Korea back on Washington's terror watch list. He described the recent hack into Sony Pictures as an act of cyber vandalism. For this story, here is Connie Lee. Do you think this was an act of war by North Korea? U.S. President Barack Obama says no, he doesn't think so. But he did call the North Korean-linked cyber attack on Sony Pictures an act of cyber vandalism. No, I don't think it was an act of war. I think it was an act of cyber vandalism that was very costly, very expensive. Speaking on CNN's State of the Union with Candy Crowley, President Obama emphasized his earlier stance that the U.S. will take action and respond accordingly to this hack attack against the movie The Interview. It was last month when Sony Pictures suffered a massive cyber attack by hackers who demanded the studio's comedy film on North Korean leader Kim Jong-un not be released. This prompted Sony to cancel its Christmas Day release amid fear of more threats. The FBI linked the hacking to North Korea on Saturday, but the communist state continues to deny any involvement. President Obama, however, is considering redesignating North Korea as a state that sponsors terrorism. We've got to work with the private sector, and the private sector has to work together to harden their sites. But in the meantime, when there's a breach, we have to go after the wrongdoer. He also called on Congress to pass a cybersecurity law to protect private sectors in the U.S. So will the interview ever be released? A lawyer for Sony Pictures speaking to NBC's Meet the Press on Sunday did say that the film will be distributed, but in what format is still unknown. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Meanwhile, North Korea has been denying any involvement in the hacking attack since the beginning and is now outraged by the U.S. accusation. It says it's, uh, it has released a strong statement vowing to retaliate against Washington. Shin Semin has more on Pyongyang's reaction. North Korea isn't just denying a hand in the cyber attack on Sony Pictures. They're threatening to retaliate for the mere suggestion that they were involved. In a statement posted Sunday, Pyongyang's National Defense Commission said it fully stands in confrontation with Washington in all war spaces, including the one on the web. The statement even threatens to blow up the White House, the Pentagon, and all of the U.S. mainland if President Barack Obama retaliates over the last month's Sony cyber hack. As for who was responsible for carrying out the attack on Sony, which set off a series of events that led to the theatrical release of the interview being canceled, the North Korean regime said they had clear evidence that the Obama administration was involved in making the film. They also stressed again that the hackers worked on their own. The statement says they don't know who or where the hackers are, but praise their attack as a righteous action and that they're supporters and sympathizers of the North. South Korea didn't escape blame in the statement. The regime said it had never carried out a single hacking attack and that all cyber attack related incidents were orchestrated by Seoul. Shin Semin, Arirang News. Meanwhile, China, North Korea's traditional ally and sponsor country, says it opposes all forms of cyber attacks and cyber terrorism. This is what Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi told U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry during their phone call on Sunday. Minister Yi, however, made no direct mention of North Korea during their conversation, which included the Sony hack attack. Washington had previously sought Beijing's help in reining in North Korea 
Korean hackers since China is a key provider of North Korea's internet access. The Chinese government has not responded to that request as of yet. North Korea is known to operate an elite unit of 3,000 cyber experts. And staying with North Korea and its uh, diplomatic gains, it has not. It has yet to officially answer Russia's offer for leader Kim Jong Un to visit Moscow next year. Regional experts say Kim might use this uh, as an opportunity to prompt a summit between Pyongyang and Beijing. For the details, here is Sun Jung In. Russian President Vladimir Putin has invited the North Korean leader Kim Jong Un to <coughs> Moscow next year to mark the 70th anniversary of his country's victory over Nazi Germany in the Second World War. Many experts say this could be an opportunity for Kim to establish a solid foothold as a leader. It would also help Pyongyang strengthen its ties with Russia, a permanent veto-wielding member of the UN Security Council, against international criticism on its human rights abuses and nuclear program. North Korea's current weakened relations with China is making Kim even more keen to find a friendly and powerful ally. China, which has taken issue with the North's nuclear arms testing and missile development, has stalled summit talks with Pyongyang for three years. Still, it's paying great attention to Kim's possible visit. Russia has invited North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, among other leaders, to Moscow for the 70th anniversary of the Soviet defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II. While some speculate Kim may make the visit to Russia as an attempt to prompt a summit between Pyongyang and Beijing, others remain skeptical as Kim has never made a foreign visit since taking power in 2011. There is also the possibility that a visit to Russia may worsen North Korea's relations with China at a time when the North is in desperate need of its help as it's been forced into a corner over its recent cyber attack on Sony Pictures and its abysmal human rights situation. Meanwhile, as South Korean President Park Geun-hye has also been invited to Russia for its celebration, it remains to be seen how the anticipated gathering of the world leaders will pan out. Son Jong-in, Arirang News. There are rising concerns here in Korea that the country could be slipping headfirst into a low growth trap. So to try and ensure this does not happen, officials have pledged to push through with comprehensive structural reforms next year. Our Hwang Jie with uh, here how our, our Hwang Jie reports on the government's to-do list for 2015. The finance ministry on Monday lowered its 2014 growth outlook to 3.4 percent and that of next year's to 3.8 percent, citing still sluggish domestic demand. To pull the economy out of its low growth rut, the government's economy management plan for next year will put emphasis on structural reforms while maintaining its expansionary policy. Structural changes will focus on the labor, education, financial and public sectors so that human resources and money, which are an economy's key elements, can be distributed efficiently. The government will seek ways to raise the female labor participation and better utilize the foreign workforce, while educational reform will place emphasis on enhancing vocational training. It plans to promote apprenticeship programs where students in college or in vocational schools can receive training directly from related companies. The government will cut red tape in the financial sector and promote the use of IT at banks and other financial institutions to foster the so-called fintech. Under the government plan, policymakers will also tackle pressing risks head-on. One major task is diffusing threats posed by snowballing household debt. The government will use a state housing fund to switch roughly $35 billion of short-term loans, carrying floating rates into longer-term fixed-rate loans. For the corporate sector, the government will introduce new measures to speed up the debt restructuring process. The move will allow troubled companies to begin workout programs before their financial health becomes irreparable. 
And through the structural changes, the government aims to lay the groundwork for sustainable economic growth, hopefully making 2015 a turning point for regaining economic vitality. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. A hacker who has claimed responsibility for leaking documents that belong to the, the country's nuclear power company says he is not done just yet. The state-run firm assures the public everything is under control, but the hacker is threatening to release a trove of other information if his demands are not met by Thursday. For the latest, here is Connie Kim. A two-day-long cybersecurity drill has begun at all of Korea's nuclear facilities in light of the recent leak of sensitive information. The Energy Ministry will work with various agencies, such as the Nuclear Safety and Security Commission, to make sure all are safe from any potential cyber attacks. Over the two-day period, the ministry will make sure that power plants are not susceptible to future hack attacks, but experts say not enough is being done. It is going to take time and money, but the nuclear reactor's operating system should be established again from scratch. Updates aren't a long-term solution. Hackers could still shut down power at the reactor from outside. The unidentified hacker leaked more information about the facilities over the weekend and threatened more leaks if the government does not shut down some of its reactors by Christmas Day. The freshly leaked data includes floor maps, operation manuals and safety reports from the state-run Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power Company and information on the Kori-2 and Warsan-1 reactors. While authorities say the information released until now poses no threat, the hackers are threatening to release tens of thousands of pages of new data, including blueprints and other classified information. The investigation team says that the attack was well-planned. They say the registration information the hacker used to set up a blog detailing the attack was stolen and that the Twitter ID he or she used was registered in the U.S. Korean investigators have requested assistance from the FBI in the probe. They haven't ruled out North Korea's involvement, with some of the malware code discovered similar to that in previous North Korean attacks. Connie Kim, Arirang News. After last week's historic ruling to disband a left-leaning party by the Constitutional Court here in Korea, judicial authorities have delivered their rulings on the fate of this party's assemblyman, but they are fighting back on their part. Our Chi Myung Gil has more. The National Election Commission decided on Monday to strip six members of the now disbanded Unified Progressive Party from their seats in provincial legislatures. The election watchdog said there was no reason for the councillors to maintain their posts. The National Election Commission has decided to reclassify the six councillors as having resigned. Under election law, since the party itself was dissolved for violating the Constitution. The six who were appointed under the proportional representation system called the decision invalid because election law dictates that seats may be taken away only when members break away from the party. They plan to file an injunction. Last Friday, the Constitutional Court ordered the dissolution of the UPP, which resulted in five of its lawmakers losing their seats in the National Assembly. Political watchers had also expected that the party's six members in post at the provincial level would also lose their seats. All five of the UPP's sitting lawmakers who were kicked out of the National Assembly say they will file a lawsuit against the state. They claim the Constitutional Court does not have the right to remove them from the legislature, as there's no law that stipulates the status of lawmakers in the case their party is dissolved. However, the court said there was no reason for the lawmakers to pursue their parliamentary seats when their party had been dissolved, a decision they should responsibly accept. Last Friday's ruling comes more than 400 days after the Justice Ministry filed a petition against the UPP following the arrest of a number of its members on rebellion and conspiracy charges. Several UPP members, including former lawmaker Lee Seok-gi, were convicted of plotting to overthrow the government in the event of war with North Korea. Kim Young-gi, Arirang News.
ask any soul light to what the capital's biggest fashion hub is, most likely the answer will be Dongdaemun Fashion Town. And with a foreign tourist flooding into the shopping center as well, its presence is rapidly expanding into overseas markets as well. Our Park Jiwon has this week's industry insight. You can't talk about Korea's fashion industry without mentioning the Dongdaemun Fashion Market. Dongdaemun Fashion Town is the largest clothing market in Korea, and about one third of all Korea's clothing distributors are based near the region. From textiles and clothing subsidiary materials to sewing factories and wholesale and retail shops, if it has to do with clothing and fashion, you will find it here. A designer's idea can be made into a final product in just a day. Let's take a look. This is Dongdaemun Fashion Town, the location of more than 30 fashion malls and tens of thousands of small clothing shops. It's really amazing, all the districts, all the fashion, it's really nice. I sometimes see items with unique designs that I cannot find at brand or department stores. Retail shops are open from midnight or 2 a.m. And wholesale shops open from 8 p.m. to the next morning, meaning the market operates 24 hours a day. What's peculiar to the district is that it's like a complete fashion ecosystem where everything about fashion is clustered together. Thousands of fabric and clothing subsidiary shops and more than 20,000 small sewing factories are all nearby. Designers can turn their ideas into clothes in just a day by making a sample. And once the design is confirmed, mass production can start after another day or two. With Tung Demun's best yet sophisticated designs gaining global recognition, many orders now come from abroad. Now we get many sample making orders from China as Chinese buyers visit Tung Demun often. The Dongdaemun district makes more money from exports than domestic sales, especially in the wholesale market. Roughly 60 percent of the town's annual revenue comes from exports. International buyers are mostly from China, Taiwan and Japan. The fashion town also serves as a test bed for many up-and-coming designers. Here's a hip fashion mecca where you can make and sell clothes. The region helps in my market research and market sourcing. Some designers have successfully grown from single shops to fashion empires. This modern brand began from a shop in Dongdaemun, but has expanded to include dozens of shops in China. Kodis Combine started as a shop in Dongdaemun in 2002. Now we have many products in many categories, particularly menswear, underwear, and a kid's clothing line. Fashion group Hyungji, which has the number one market share in women's clothes as a domestic company, also started as a humble shop in Dongdaemun Market in the early 1980s. The founder of the group still emphasizes the so-called Dongdaemun spirit, which is characterized by designs that are ahead of their time in order to survive the fierce competition, thorough product management and affordable prices. The Dongdaemun fashion market has served as a breeding ground for clothing businesses and designers ever since the end of Korean War. Thanks to the market's unique features and its vibrant energy, Korea's leading fashion hub now attracts millions of people from both inside and outside of the country. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. New York is reeling from the weekend shooting deaths of two police officers who are sitting in their squad car. For more, uh, Polly is joining us from the News Center. Paul, there's been more information coming out from authorities about this uh, shooter. What can you tell us about this guy? Well, investigators say the African-American suspect, apparently motivated by the Eric Gardner case, had been boasting to bystanders just as he pulled the trigger on Saturday. He was reportedly described by his own family members as a violent person. This says New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio has condemned the killings as an assassination. Our Kim Minji has the details. Authorities say the gunman identified as 28-year-old Ismail Brinsley had a long criminal history. He had been arrested at least 19 times for various crimes from shoplifting to gun possession. 
On Saturday, Brinsley shot and wounded his former girlfriend before gunning down two officers, an Asian and a Hispanic, who were sitting in their police car and later took his own life. It's believed Brinsley may have been seeking revenge for the recent deaths of two black men at the hands of white officers. He had previously posted angry anti-police and government messages on social media. Most of his postings and rants are on the Instagram account. Uh, and what we're seeing from this right now is anger against the government. Uh, there's others with talks of um, anger at the police. He specifically mentions Michael Brown and Eric Garner. His family also told police that he had a violent childhood and tried to commit suicide before. In light of the assassination-style killings and lingering tensions over police tactics, some officers criticized New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, saying he was not very supportive in the face of public anger. Patrick Lynch, the president of the New York Police Union, said the mayor has blood on his hands after Saturday's killings. In a separate development, a veteran policeman was also shot and killed in the state of Florida on Sunday while responding to a call. Authorities say a 23-year-old suspect was taken into custody, but didn't provide details about a possible motive. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. And uh, switching gears now to the biggest wedding hitting the headlines, the legendary musician Elton John has married his longtime partner David Furnish at a ceremony in England. I'm sure this will go down as one of the most celebrated weddings to hit the UK. Well, it's definitely attracted some of the biggest names in the music industry as well as Hollywood. But unlike many other celebrity weddings, Sir Elton John shared his big day through the photo sharing website Instagram. So definitely check that out. The 67 year old British singer tied the knot with David Furnish on Sunday, turning their civil partnership into an official marriage, which only became legal for same sex couples in England earlier this year. Furnish is a 52 year old former advertising executive turned filmmaker. The two exchanged vows at John's Berkshire State in southeastern Windsor. The lavish event was attended by a star-studded array of guests, including Victoria and David Beckham, singer Lulu, and actor Hugh Grant. Mm -mm, you don't get to see that kind of uh, wedding too often. Now, turning to the U.S., Paul, uh, New York's most famous tower has gotten a holiday makeover, greeting millions of residents and tourists citywide. It's one of those iconic symbols of the holiday season and eye-catching, to say the least. Well, many New Yorkers certainly got a visual treat this past weekend as the Empire State Building illuminated the city's skyline in a jaw-dropping display of colors and lights. Over 15,000 channels of the building's LEDs will be synchronized to holiday theme music on local radio stations through Tuesday. Organizers say the public can vote online for the best light theme, which will then be replayed on Christmas Eve. Designer Mark Brickman choreographed the show on the 440-meter-high skyscraper in Midtown Manhattan. Mm, that certainly looks beautiful. And New York is not the only place where the holiday spirit is uh, being felt. From coast to coast, Americans, young and old alike, are embracing this uh, seasonal uh, parties, festivities. And this is what I love about Christmas. Just, it's not just about what you get for uh, Christmas gifts. It's about that warm feeling that you get with your friends and family. Well, the presents aren't too bad either. And speaking of which, I need to get on that gift shopping mm -hmm. soon. But coming back to your point, yes, you're right. People from Connecticut to California are finding incredibly touching and sometimes unique ways to celebrate Christmas. Decorating one's house is a long time tradition. In New Britain, 90 year old Rita Giancola has been doing so for visitors for decades and only asking for donations for charity in return. Here. But in 1978, this is when I started the open house. I was a little scared, though, to have people come into my house. And the first year I opened up, oh my God, I had thousands of people that came through. It takes a couple of months. I used to do everything inside and outside till I was about 84, and now I'm 90. Another symbol of the holidays is those red kettles you see on nearly every street corner these days. The Salvation Army has been collecting donations for over a century to help those who need and most need during the holiday season, raising nearly 136 million U.S. dollars last year. Mm. Chetty? 
Well, I can just uh, feel the holiday spirit, although I don't think we'll ever match uh, the lady's um, house or her Christmas spirit. All right, Paul, let's uh, leave it there for now, and let's find some time for last-minute Christmas shopping as well. And we'll see you again in just about two hours. Hope your week got off to a great start. I'm Kim Bo Gyeong with the weather updates. Well, Monday began with cold wave advisories issued in some regions. In fact, morning lows over in Gangwon province dipped to minus 20 degrees. And at the moment, we are under mostly clear skies. This month has been colder than the seasonal average with cold wave advisories and heavy snowfall. But there's some relief as temperatures will begin to ease up from tomorrow afternoon. Looking ahead, it seems like we won't be able to enjoy a white Christmas, but we will be able to wrap up the year under moderate temperatures and clear skies. On to Tuesday's readings. Seoul will mix it to 5, Daegu and Gwangju hit 7. On to other places, Jeju makes it to 10, Dokdo hits 8. Those are the updates I have for you now. I'll see you soon. And that will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Thanks for watching.